This episode is sponsored by Care Of. Stay tuned later in the episode for a special offer. Subscribe and click the notification bell if you want to make friends with the Boogeyman. Skinwalkers, Werewolves, and the Wendigo. The most horrifying monsters and scarily some of the most commonly sighted ones across America. Odds are, if you've had a scary experience in the woods, you might have heard or nearly encountered one of these bad boys. Well, today, I have an extra big episode about real sightings of these creatures. Welcome our special guest, the host of the Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales podcast, as we share these stories with you. Be sure to check out his show with the link in the description. Also, if you've ever wanted your story featured on the show, the first thing you gotta do is submit it at darknessprevails.org. Otherwise, leave a comment below, letting me know what topic you want to hear next. Thank you. Weatherman and the Cuyahoga Valley Buzzer From The Woodsman Location, Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Northern Ohio This encounter occurred very close to my home woods of Ohio, way up north in Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Cuyahoga Valley is a smaller park, one of the few parks in the East Coast area, and it doesn't get nearly as much love as it should. That being said, it's somewhat of a private haven for those of us who take the trip into the valley, escaping the more populous of parks. Due to the nature of the sites of the valley, having two to three people per group is probably the best. I had ached for a return to the forest for a while, as it had been a fair amount of time since my last excursion. So after some convincing, I managed to call up an old friend of the area and convince him to go on a hike with me. Now he wasn't a camper at all. 90% of what he carried that weekend was gear borrowed from me but I was excited to take him on the trip with me. For those less experienced in the world of the outdoors, a big tradition and rite of passage for any novice outdoorsman was to earn a trail name, a unique nickname given by other more experienced hikers, usually in reference to an event at a camp or something like that. They called me Spades, and due to some card game fun on one of my first long hikes, the reason I'm explaining all of this is because I had decided to take it upon myself to find an appropriate trail name for my friend. I had assumed it would be something silly, like a friend of mine whose name was Ramen Bauman. Following his wicked concoction of a ramen potato spam hybrid, my hopes for a jovial, lighthearted name never came though, as after the event of that night, he had forever earned the name Weatherman. Here's why. Me and Weatherman's trip started out perfectly, as most trips do. The forecast for the three-day trip was all sunny for the first two days. Then there was a rolling storm going through the last night. As we knew this in advance, we were trying not to get hit by it, but that entirely depended on our speed of the hike. The trouble didn't start until the second night. Weatherman had brought along a small radio, one that he used to check on the weather occasionally. Each night before lights out, we would listen to the scheduled segment of the calm, serene meteorologist lady predict the upcoming storms. On the first night, it was not a big deal at all. There was supposed to be light rain on our last night and not much else. On the second night, the calm lady informed us that the upcoming storm would actually be quite heavy, and accordingly, heavy rain was to be expected. By the end of the third day's hike, the clouds above were dark and glum. The intense scent of rain hung over the whole area. Most of the other hikers there were smarter than us and had made the decision to skip that night. I, however, wanted to show Weatherman that rain doesn't always mean a bad time. To remedy the oncoming water, we strung up the tarp that I usually sleep under above Weatherman's tent, and we both stayed under that. At around 4 p.m., the water began to trickle in, 
and only 20 minutes after that, there was a huge deluge of liquid. Again, we were prepared for this and had eaten lunch early and gotten as prepared for the short walk out in the morning as possible. We hunkered down into the tent as the light outside slowly faded away. Weatherman, in accordance to his previous nightly actions, flicked on the radio. Rather than the greeting of the soothing weather lady, we were met by the unnerving buzz that National Weather Service alerts make. You know the ones I mean. The somewhat high-pitched ones that really just shake your nerves a bit. Listening to this warning, it predicted heavy rains and flash flood possibilities. We were up high in our sights, so we both decided to get some sleep early, so we could pack it out in the morning rather quickly. At around 2 a.m., both me and Weatherman jolted awake in our sleeping bags. In confusion, we looked at each other. We could hear the intense rains outside. A weatherman reached down for his radio and flicked it on. The same rattling buzz screech was playing again, this time on loop, meaning stuff was getting serious. The automated voice even warned us of a tornado warning, and we both knew we could not stay any longer. Immediately, we began packing up our things in the tent. All we had left to do was to remove the tarp pack away the tent, and trek out. I went out to grab my tarp first, being that it was an expensive piece of equipment, and we both figured if we had to leave the cheap Walmart tent, that'd be okay. When I had finished with the tarp, I returned to the tent to grab my bag and get oriented on the way out. Sitting down, weatherman across from me, I looked at my map and started planning the route. I was focused on the map and my compass, so when that weather alert buzz screeched again, I was startled. I said to Weatherman, Will you please turn that dang thing off? It's annoying. There was no response. I looked up at Weatherman. He was white as a ghost. Slowly, he looked me in the eyes. Th th that wasn't me he stammered out. I know he wasn't joking around. The buzz happened again, and we sat silent. The buzz came again and again, over and over, unnerving us more with each buzz, and it wasn't coming from the radio. Something was mimicking the sound from outside the tent. We both slung our bags in as quiet as we could, continuing to sit in silence. Suddenly, there was a buzz that was louder than ever, obviously coming from right outside our tent. It was loud enough to make my ears ring. Without a word, we burst out of the tent into the blinding rain and towards the nearest road. We sprinted in the direction of our truck and didn't stop until we were inside and on our way home. When I returned to the site about three days later to recover our things, to my surprise, it was still in excellent condition. The door still open from our sudden departure revealed the only thing inside, Weatherman's radio, except it had been smashed to pieces. To this day, Weatherman shivers like a leaf when he hears that buzzing sound on the radio. Neither of us have stayed the night at the park since, but I might return soon. Beware of strange weather in Kyohoga Valley, or in the forest at all. There's no telling what hides in the cloak of rain, waiting for thunder to strike to mask its own. The Creature in the Snow From Silverwolf69 Location The Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains Read by Stories, Fables, and Ghostly Tales 
I have been hiking many times in the Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains of the Mid-Atlantic United States. My favorite part is in Pennsylvania, due to it being miles upon miles of nothing but mountains. A few years ago, I went hiking with two guys from my school wrestling team, Patrick Labuz and John Nahe. We all agreed that we would go during winter, since the mountains are even more enticing when all white and gray. I had never hiked during winter before, but figured it would be fun. In one word, no. We got a late start on our first day of camping, and were on edge because we didn't find a spot until 6pm. It wasn't snowing, so we built a campfire and talked about the school years. We had all graduated in 2010, it was now 2019. I asked them if they had any scary things happen to them. Patrick said, Well, I've heard about this area, but never took much stock in it. John and I pestered him to tell us what he had heard. He said that a friend of his had seen Bigfoot in the area we were at. The description is what you would expect. Seven and a half feet tall, about 600 pounds, dark red or brown fur, and disproportional body attributes, like extremely long arms and a heavy stomach. John and I both figured that a sighting that accurate didn't sound like a lie. I've always believed in Sasquatch and his counterparts, but John didn't. I figured if he was interested, it was credible. Patrick finished by telling us, The footprints they found were measured and wound up, being 21 inches long. John started to snicker and said, <laughs> I guess Shaquille O'Neal lent him his shoes. <laughs> I didn't make a joke because a foot that long sounded feasible if it was a monster. I told Patrick that the Bigfoot was probably long gone by now. But I had no idea that he or she was much closer than I anticipated. The first few days were uneventful. On the fourth day, a snow squall came out of nowhere just past noon. We decided to find some trees for cover and found a nice thicket that was heavily wooded but didn't have any brambles or thorn bushes with enough space to move around. We all hunkered down inside our tent and passed around REMs, ready to eat meals like the military use. We were able to sleep without any problem as the snow continued to fall. The next morning, I woke up and decided to look outside. About eight inches of snow had fallen, so it wasn't too hard to navigate. I was about to turn around when I noticed something in the snow pile. I got closer and saw a weird shape, something like a very large footprint that had four toes. I thought about mentioning it to my two friends, but then I saw something that scared me to death. Before I go on, I was wide awake and not sleepy at all, so I know what I saw. I saw someone or something standing near a group of trees that was only about 50 feet away. I estimated the thing to be about seven feet, extremely strong, very large all around, and was cinnamon colored. I fought the urge to yell out in alarm, and instead backed up slowly, never taking my eyes off the creature. I was about to enter a hidden area, when the figure turned and looked right at the spot where I was. I froze and didn't even blink. I wasn't even sure if it saw me or not. After a tense 20 seconds, the creature turned away and lumbered through the woods away from me. I didn't take a single step until it was out of sight. Afraid, and with fear trumping common sense, I ran as fast as I could to tell Patrick and John what I had seen. When I arrived at our campsite, I saw everything was packed up, and Patrick was in the car, with John climbing into the trunk. I asked him what was going on, and Patrick told me to just get in so we could go. I got in without argument and made him swear to tell me what had happened while I was gone. When we got to a park ranger station, he led me and John inside. He told me, I don't know what caused it, but that so-called fake monster was in our campsite shortly before you got back. John and I had hidden in our tent and got flat on our backs so it didn't see us. Patrick and John are both tough guys, so... If they had been terrified by something that they hadn't even seen clearly, I knew it was true. I told them that I had also seen the Bigfoot from close range. We asked a park ranger, and he told us, You aren't the first ones. In fact, 
till the 15th, 16th, and 17th to report that. I keep thinking about possibly closing that area, yet it doesn't seem fair. I'm just glad you boys aren't hurt. I haven't been to that area since. I still go hiking, sometimes alone, sometimes with friends. I keep wondering, what would have happened if that thing had come after me? To be honest, my guess is it wouldn't have been good. Marty's Woods Monster from General Winters Location, Lowell, Vermont My aunt rented out a section of a woman's house for a few years in Lowell, Vermont. My father would often bring us up there over the summer to go swimming and to see our cousins. Our cousins would often tell us stories of seeing shadows outside at night, hearing footsteps and nails being ripped from the walls, and paintings being smashed. I didn't believe their stories until I had a paranormal experience of my own at their house. It happened one time we were playing hide-and-seek, but that's not what this story is about. My sister and I stayed the night one weekend near the end of summer vacation. We decided to pull an all-nighter and at around midnight, we all decided to play manhunt in the woods. The person hunting had a flashlight and the rules were, if he had you in the flashlight, you had five seconds to get out or you were considered caught and you had to sit in the garage until the round was over. My oldest cousin drew the short straw the rest of us took off into the forest. I hid behind some bushes right next to a tall evergreen tree, looking toward the house. I could see my cousin looking around the shorter trees about 50 feet away from me. He eventually moved on out of my line of sight, and everything was quiet. Quieter than it was before. It was like someone took the volume knob and turned it all the way to the left. Suddenly, the silence was broken when I heard a few footsteps to my left. Of course, I thought it was the seeker, but they didn't have a flashlight on. I didn't see any beams of light coming from him, so I figured it was another hider. I quietly go over and lean out from the tree to see who it is. There's a dark figure facing away from me in what looked like the fetal position. I whispered to them, but before I could get out the first word, they jumped like I had startled them. They slowly raised themselves up and turned to look at me. This was no person or child. Whatever I was now looking at had pure white eyes. It lacked pupils and it raised itself to a height of about seven feet. Its lanky arms reached all the way down to the ground. It didn't make a noise, and it didn't move. It simply looked at me. I couldn't see its face very well, because its eyes were so bright. After a few seconds, I saw a flashlight beam shine onto it, and I could hear my cousin, who thought he had found one of us, begin to count. One... Two, th th three. It was right at three that I could tell that he realized what he was looking at. The creature darted its eyes onto my cousin, and it did something that scared me, something that I didn't think it could do. It raised a long finger up to its mouth and shushed him. Then it jumped into a nearby tree and crawled from branch to branch until we could no longer see it. My cousin basically whimpered. He was trying to say, what was that? I grabbed him by his arm. We need to just get inside. No one else saw the thing that night. My cousin has since denied seeing anything himself, and my sister said that I was simply trying to get attention. Sometimes, I swear, I keep seeing it. 
I live just outside of a city with a few patches of woods here and there. And some nights when my wife gets home, her headlights hit the trees and I swear to God, I see the outline of that thing from long ago, its hands covering its eyes. I've told my wife about it, but she jokes about it and has instead given it a nickname, Kano Wikakti, which means forest hunter. Now, a quick message from our sponsor, Care Of. If you're a busy person and need a boost in energy, or you're trying to get your life and diet back on track, Care Of is what you need. Care Of is a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. It's a new year. Try building a vitamin routine that's made just for you and your health goals. Using Care Of's online quiz makes this easy and fun. It asks you about your diet, health goals, and lifestyle choices, and it only takes five minutes to figure out your personal, scientifically-backed vitamin and supplement recommendations. I apparently needed a lot more vitamin B in my life. Then Care of delivers daily vitamins and supplement packs customized to your recommendations to promote personal health and wellness. That's because getting your vitamins should be easy and convenient. Plus, you can use the Care Of app to easily track your progress and earn rewards whenever you remember to take your vitamins. And that's not to mention a portion of every sale goes towards the Good Plus Foundation, which provides expecting mothers in need with valuable prenatal vitamins. I was sent a free month of Care Of supplements to try it out, and I love it. It's quick and easy to remember, and in particular, I really love the extra batteries packs. You just rip one open and eat it like a pixie stick, then boom, you've got plenty of caffeine and vitamins for a much needed boost. So if you want to take the first step in positive change and help us keep our show free for everyone, use the link below or go to takecareof.com and use promo code DPP for 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins. That's takecareof.com and promo code DPP for 25% off your first month. Thanks, Karev. Now, back to the show. Ruguru, from Warning Page 803. Location, Hayden, Alabama. Read by Stories, Fables, and Ghostly Tales. My grandmother's farm was situated on 15 acres of land north of Hayden, Alabama. It was several hours from our home and we would make the drive there a handful of times a year, mostly in the summers. I can remember the anticipation I would feel as we drove up the long driveway to find the modest house, which my grandfather Elmer had built with his bare hands, perched atop the hill. Picturing it now, I see the rusted tin roof, the weathered porch, and the dilapidated barn that stood out back. As a child, none of that mattered to us, obviously. We spent our days roaming the rolling countryside, swimming in a nearby creek and playing on the old oak that grew beside the house, whose branches were so large they scraped the ground. The fields surrounding the farmed house were no longer fertile, providing ample space for us to properly conduct the adventures we concocted in our minds and were surrounded by the dense forests of the Alabama countryside. I always cherished the time I spent with my grandmother. When we were inside, she was always singing to us, telling us stories about when she was a girl, teaching us how to make things out of sticks and string, and passing down the type of random wisdom that only a grandmother can. Unfortunately, I never knew my grandfather. My grandmother said he died in a hunting accident when I was very young. I heard so much about him from her and my parents, however, that I felt like I knew him. He was a large man, strong as an ox, my grandmother would say, who would farm the fields from sunup to sundown, without so much as a whisper of a complaint. My grandmother, her family of Cajun descent, had met my grandfather at school in Louisiana, and the two had moved out to this land, left to them by Elmer's uncle, to start a life together. My mother had been born in this very farmhouse. I respected my grandmother more than any other person on the earth. She was not without her quirks, 
The strangest of which was her insistence that we follow three specific rules as long as we were there. I can remember her pulling my sister and I close, kissing us on the forehead, and gently reminding us about them each time we arrived, her frail and wrinkled hands cradling ours. Don't leave food outside. No singing past dark, and most importantly, never go into the woods. She never explained why they were important, only that they were important. The rules were something we really questioned. Grandma said to follow them, so we did. Simple as that. The first two were pretty easy. I wasn't much of a singer, and we didn't have food outside unless my grandmother had given it to us. But the third was a bit more challenging. Her property was surrounded by woods on all sides, with a buffer of several hundred yards between the house and the tree line, and my sister and I were often tempted to go exploring within. We'd ask permission, stating our ages as proof that we were responsible and could take care of ourselves. Without fail, she would always reply, The rules are for your safety, Shah. You mustn't break them. Shah is a Cajun word that means dear. For the sake of clarity, I'm translating the rest of her Cajun speak into regular English for this account. I can remember one evening, when my sister was only three or four years old, when she accidentally left some food outside. We had been eating bologna sandwiches on the back steps. I remember we both liked ours smashed down and cut into little squares. Having finished mine, I had gone inside to get something to drink and she had followed me, leaving her plate behind. Later that night... We were all in front of the fireplace, curled up in Grandma's lap under one of her large quilts, telling stories and laughing when we heard something scratching at the back door. Immediately, I felt her body tense underneath me, and she shot a glance over to my father, who was sitting on the floor. He tried to keep her face blank, but I could see the worry creeping through. What is that, Grandma? I asked. Probably just a raccoon. Probably just a raccoon, my father said, starting to stand. Sha, let me. Grandma said, my father picked us up from her lap, gently placed us on the floor as she made her way to the back of the house. A few moments later, she walked back into the den and sat back down. She was holding my sister's empty plate from earlier. When my sister saw the plate and the look on my grandmother's face, she burst into tears. It's okay, she said, hugging my sister tightly. Let's do our best not to do this again, okay? Later that night, when everyone was in bed, I crept out from beneath the covers and tiptoed to the back door. It was open. I don't think the house had air conditioning and the doors were often left open with the screen doors closed to keep the bugs out. I was old enough to be curious about what happened earlier and young enough to not be scared about what I might find. There was a single bulb above the back door that cast a narrow beam of light that illuminated the back steps. On the top two steps, bathed in the eerie light of the dim bulb, were dozens of long, black hairs. After the food incident, I became a bit more aware about the things that happened around the farmhouse and started to have the notion that my grandmother was hiding something. I wasn't sure what it was, but whatever was at the back door was part of it. The next year, my sister and I found a dead deer about 50 yards in from the tree line. I think it was a deer at least. Its head was completely missing and its body was completely mutilated. Even at my young age, I knew no other animal had done that. When I told my grandmother about it, rather than being shocked, she acted as if it was commonplace, saying to stay away from it and that my father would take it away somewhere. The next year, there was one night where we were all woken by something banging around in the barn. In the morning, when we went out to investigate, it was clear that someone had vandalized it. One of the barn doors was completely ripped off of the front, and everything inside was torn apart, like someone was looking for something. Grandma said it must have been thieves looking for iron to scrap. But what thief would go looking for iron in a barn in the middle of nowhere? Later that same trip, as I was playing on the old oak, I noticed my sister had strayed rather close to the tree line. The next thing I knew, I saw my father sprinting across the fields towards her. When he reached her, 
He grabbed her, threw her over his shoulder, and sprinted back towards the farmhouse. He had scared the shit out of her, so I guess that's why she was crying hysterically. But my father never would say why. He had to get her away from there so quickly. There were other incidents like that over the years, but what they meant in some I had never figured out. The last time I visited my grandmother's farm was the summer I turned 16. It was the summer my grandmother finally told me about the secret she had been keeping for so long. At 16, as most kids are, I was pretty defiant. I still had great respect for my grandmother. Don't get me wrong, but I was growing a bit tired of the seemingly arbitrary nature of her rules, especially the third one. Never go into the woods. What was I? Five? By that time, I had basically run out of things to do at the farm and wanted desperately to explore the woods I had been barred from entering for so long. So one day, I did. It was an exceptionally hot July day, and I decided to follow the little creek that wound through the corner of her property into the woods. The foliage was dense and unforgiving, blocking out much of the sun and providing much needed respite from the heat. I kicked my shoes off and began walking along the creek's sandy bay, losing myself in the hum of the water as it rushed around various sticks and stones and the chatter of the birds and insects around me. When I had gone far enough that I couldn't see the tree line, I noticed that aside from the sound of the water, I couldn't hear the sounds of the birds or insects any longer. The forest had become deathly silent. The air was unnaturally still, creating an odd sense of uneasiness within me. Never forgetting my grandmother's warnings and believing I had somehow worn out my welcome, I hastily turned to head back to the farmhouse. I stopped when I heard the crack of a branch far off in the distance behind me. Afraid to look back, I started walking again. A few steps later, I heard it again. It was the sound of someone or something moving through dense underbrush in my direction. I turned slowly, and what I saw scared the living shit out of me. In the distance, I saw the silhouette of some lumbering beast walking towards me through the forest. It was tall, over six feet, and looked mostly like a man, except there appeared to be ears sprouting from the top of its dark head. I could see its eyes, large and yellow, shining at me even though the rest of its head was shrouded in darkness. I stumbled backwards, falling into the sandy water, then turned and tore through the woods, sprinting over rocks and pine cones and briars in a mad dash to escape whatever was coming for me. I didn't even bother stopping to grab my shoes. When I made it back to the farmhouse, I slammed the outer door and locked it shut, then ran inside to find my grandmother. I found her sitting at the kitchen table, preparing some beans for dinner. I was a mess. I was covered in sweat wet and sandy, and I'm sure my eyes belayed my terror. When she looked up at me, she could tell immediately that something had happened. Were you in the woods? Was all she asked. I'm sorry, Grandma. I didn't know. There was a thing. A... I stumbled over my words, not sure exactly what to say to her. Instead of being angry, she looked at me with sadness in her eyes and motioned for me to come and sit beside her. My foot was bleeding, and once she had bandaged it up, she began to tell me a story. The Loop Garou is what you saw. It's also called a Rogaroo outside of Louisiana, I believe. My mother used to tell me the tales about a monster, part man and part wolf, that would roam the swamps around her home and snatch children who had strayed too far from their parents. A children's fable, surely, which I never really believed it to be true, yet the stories still scare me. It wasn't until we moved here to the farm that I realized it wasn't just a story. Your grandfather, on one of his hunting trips, found the carcass of an animal that had been ripped to shreds beyond recognition. He hunted the animal he believed had caused it, thinking it was a bear, and finally tracked it to its den deep in the forest. It was no bear, child. Your grandfather described it as a man, with long dark hair covering his body, yet with the head of a wolf, just like the stories. 
The two fought, your grandfather prevailing, but not before being gravely injured. Several hours after he came back that night, a sickness overtook him. He wailed and moaned in his sleep that night, and in the morning his eyes had sunken into his head, and the hair on his body had started to grow long and deep black. A few hours later, he was gone. I guess he had realized what was happening and didn't want to endanger me. The thing you saw today in the forest, child, that was your grandfather. My heart was broken, having lost the only man I had ever loved. I didn't know how to cope with it. I would sit out on the back steps and sing old songs that my mother would sing to me, and I would see him, or rather it, would creep out of the forest to listen, only coming close enough to show me that he was there. I would leave food out on the back steps at night, and he would come and eat, always licking the plate clean. I don't think the transformation was complete then. Your grandfather was still there inside, somewhere. I hoped he could somehow come back from whatever he had become. Then I started to hear the howling and find the dead animals. That's when I knew your grandfather was gone. The rules, now you can see, are meant to protect you, child. He is drawn to the food and to the singing, still remembering how I confronted him during those early days. And anything that goes into the woods doesn't come out alive. I'm thankful you're here. This must be your last trip here, child. Now that he has seen you close up, he will have a taste for your blood, and he won't stop until he drains every last bit from your body. Your grandfather has several guns here, but I dare not use them, and I caution you to heed this warning. I see the look in your eyes. If you did succeed in killing him, I fear you would face the same fate as your grandfather. If the old tales are true, he who kills the Roguru eventually becomes one. Strange Events in Alamuchi Township from Genji Yeager Location, Alamuchi, New Jersey This is a follow-up from my previous story about a pale white hominid that I could not identify. A month or two ago, in dumb horror movie teen fashion, I had gotten mad at my grandparents for something stupid. This time, I thought they came too early to pick me up from work. I was furious because I still had a few hours left, so I said I didn't want to ride back. A few hours pass by, and I start my several-mile walk from work to home in the pitch dark on the main road. Things were good until I heard a strange, demented, bird-like call from the lake near the villa. I didn't see anything, but I started to get a bad feeling until I got to the road that branches off and leads right to the villa. I kept walking and went over the bridge over the highway and continued further, eventually walking downhill and passing a Shell gas station and the local general store then down to the Alamuchi Elementary School. From there, I turned left onto the road that I'd usually walk to get home, and when I did, everything went unnaturally quiet. The feeling of dread multiplied. I turned back and turned left from where i just walked, deciding to go to a more direct route. A few cars passed me, and I just kept walking, still feeling that really bad fear in my heart that caused me to change direction. I reached where the trees got thick, making the road ahead appear blacker than ink. My instincts compelled me to stop and turn back and stay under a road light at the intersection by the school. Before I could turn back, my sense of dread amplified tenfold when I saw a thin, gaunt, blacker-than-night figure darting between the trees to my right. Although brief, I could see its hands were clawed and its legs were digitigrade, meaning that it walked on its toes without its heels touching the ground. Its body had dog-like features, but no tail. 
It bolted around from tree to tree without making a single sound or track whatsoever. I kept my calm, despite what danger I was obviously in, because I knew that I was being stalked by something. I walked back to the road light by the school and messaged Grandma to come get me. My fear had not gone away, and within 45 minutes she finally arrived having to finish my housework before picking me up. I finally felt relieved. I told her what I saw following me, and she said that it sounded like a Yi Naldalushi, or a skinwalker. Alamuchi used to belong to Native Americans until other settlers wiped them out and chased them off or made slaves of them. I've no doubt that a Navajo tribe may have lived here on this land many years ago, and I hope that I don't have to see that thing again. I barely made it out alive this time. My Skinwalker Experience from Marilyn G. Location Unknown Read by Stories, Fables, and Ghostly Tales the Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anazazi's origins and departures. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food, and went into another dimension or some equivalent. But, whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in the Anazazi ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc., as such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye, and I got this strange fixation of going over there. I am not Navajo, and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliffs without rope, and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was like some obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was like magnetism. I wanted to be sure in those ruins, and it wasn't just some tourist-like curiosity. I felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks, and I was so frustrated, I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growling coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making the growl. But Mountain Lion immediately rose to mind, and I got my ass back up the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming. Things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost a growl, then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing there, certainly not on the clifftops, where we heard it, anyway. The creepy part was that, while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns though, and were sleeping with no bags or tents, just some blankets under the stars and a little fire. So I felt safe when we all laid down. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else laying with their eyes open wide, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set, maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smashing rock noises there were, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises, no nothing. Finally, David, who was kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious of his family, shouted, SHUT, Shut up! UP! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared to each other, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet, and then we heard 
another super weird noise from the Anasazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it sounded kind of like a zebra noise, like these squeaky trills. It got louder, and then the rocks, sticks, whatever, started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching. In my opinion, those were the most terrifying. Owls hooting, and through it all those terrible zebra noises. We said nope, and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse the fire, pack up our blankets, and speed away, and the noises were continuing that entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me, and said that she could tell that I had a rough day, to avoid a lecture about fucking with the spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal. It felt like I wanted to go there. Why couldn't I go there? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public accessible kiva, kind of a tourist trap for a little paddock place. But since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kiva, and I went alone. As of course my superstitious family would refuse to enter other native dwellings, I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I worked at a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone, and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kiva. My brothers always warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I, of course, didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping at the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I'd been. That's what skinwalkers do. They mess with your mind. While I was pacing in front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was fucking stupid and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets, looked out to the sky, looked in the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never ever be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like six parking lots. In one of those lots far away from me, maybe 100 feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog. It was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers and I started walking toward it, making the come here doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound with its whole body grey in colour. But there was something very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands, and its lower back was moving to and fro, if that makes any sense. When I heard it, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes. Way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no regular animal makes. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me, or was taunting me. Somehow, in the middle of all this, I realized it didn't have a tail. And I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationality, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the doors shut behind me. And by then, when I looked, of course, the fucking thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, 
they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker, and they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and I have never since even slightly wanted to visit Cliff Ruins. Czechoslovakia Forest From K Location Location The Czech Republic This is my Bobby's or grandma's story from when she lived in Czech. It begins when I was listening to some scary stories, namely about skinwalkers and Wendigo, when my dedo or grandpa said that those are dumb stories and that none of it's real. At the time, I didn't believe they were real either, but when Bobby spoke up about her story, I don't know what to think. Apparently, when she was younger, she lived in a village near a forest in Czechoslovakia. She had friends in the distant but neighboring village and regularly went there to play table tennis with them. The village had a road around the forest, or you could just cut through it and get there in half the time. Now, my grandma admits that she stayed there longer than she was allowed, and it had become night already. This was before phones or things like that. She knew her mother would be very angry coming home so late, so she took off walking back home, but decided to take the quicker route and cut through the forest. She had done this a lot, namely during the day, so she figured it would be fine. But as she walked through the woods, the forest grew silent and she was hit by a pungent odor. It was hard to describe the scent and she said that she had an overwhelming feeling of fear, which only doubled when she heard the noise. It was heavy footsteps and the sound of someone muttering. She got scared, so she hid under a tree, pressing herself into it too afraid to look. Suddenly, something began to press her back, pushing her towards the tree, making it impossible for her to let go of it and run. She didn't even attempt to struggle and stayed there for a long time. Finally, it let her go and she immediately ran home. Upon arriving home, she knocked on the door and her angry mother answered. Bobby immediately started apologizing. Her mom started yelling at her for not replying to her when she got home. Bobby tried to explain that she only just got home now, but her mother wasn't listening saying that she saw her get home an hour ago and walk right into her room. But that wasn't possible. Bobby doesn't know what happened back in Czech, and I don't know either. I've never heard a story like it before, and I'm not sure if this was a monster or what. This story scares me more than any other, as I know Bobby would not make this kind of stuff up, and she doesn't even like me watching scary movies. But now, it has me wondering about things, and maybe even a little scared of the nearby woods. Weird Encounter from Drake J. Location, Jefferson, Texas. Read by Stories, Fables, and Ghostly Tales. The first time I saw this thing was a couple of years ago. I was hunting with a friend in North Texas near a small town called Jefferson. We will call him Jim. We set up in a blind near a clearing and we were there for a few hours. When we finally saw what looked like a massive buck, we watched him enter the field and I started to take him when a sense of fear came over me. That's when Jim said, What the fuck? That's not a normal buck. I looked over at Jim and asked, what do you mean? He told me to look at it closer, through my scope. I did and he was right, it wasn't a normal buck. It had pure white eyes and what looked like decaying skin around its knees. We sat there, looking at it for at least 10 minutes, when we realized that it was completely quiet. We didn't hear anything besides that thing walking in the field. It wandered off and we just sat there speechless. That was the calmest encounter with that thing. The next time I saw it was last year in Shepherd, Texas, 
a hour out of Houston. I was walking through the woods with Jim when we saw it again. This time it saw us and stood up and made this god-awful noise that seemed to last forever, except it was only a couple of seconds. After it stopped, me and Jim were still covering our ears when the thing started walking towards us. We turned and ran to the exit of the woods, which was half a mile away. We ran as fast as we could, and we could hear that thing behind us the entire time, never getting closer and never falling behind. We got back to the road and hopped into Jim's truck. He started it up, and we got out of there as quick as we could. The last time I saw it was a few weeks ago in Shepherd, Texas again. I was staying the night at my girlfriend's house, and we just got done watching a movie. I went outside to smoke a cigarette before bed. I was halfway done with it when I noticed a figure standing at the edge of the woods behind her house. I couldn't make it out too well, so I called my girlfriend to grab a flashlight and her pistol, just in case it was a person wanting to do us harm. She came out and handed them both to me. I pointed the flashlight in the direction of the figure, and my face went pale. After I realized what I was looking at, it was the same creature as before, but it was a little different. This time it had its mouth wide open, like it was in awe of something. I aimed the pistol at it and told my girlfriend to head inside, but stay by the door with it opened so I could run in if need be. After she went in and was watching me, I fired three rounds at that damn thing, and that's when I realized I had made the biggest mistake of my life. It screamed that ear-piercing scream and charged at me. I ran inside as quick as I could and my girlfriend shut the door behind me and locked it. The creature slammed into the wall like a sledgehammer slamming into concrete. We could hear that thing breathing heavily and started scratching at the brick on the outside of the house. After an hour, the scratching stopped and we sat on the couch with the door locked and the blinds closed. I could hear it walking back and forth outside the front door for at least three hours. By the time it was 1am, the noises stopped and everything was silent. We sat in silence for another hour before we headed to the bedroom, shaking like crazy and scared out of our minds. If anyone knows what this thing is and why I keep seeing it, please let me know. The Thing in the Mine From Kiwi Nation Location The Sierra Nevada Mountains It was June 22nd. I was home alone and had decided to go exploring. I was 12 years old at the time. I lived in the Sierra Nevadas. Now I knew that I lived next to an old mine, but I'd never had the courage to explore it before. But that night was different. Armed with a flashlight, I decided it was time to see what was inside this old mine. Inside the mine, it smelled of sulfur and kind of like rotting meat. The place looked like it hadn't been visited in ages, which made experiencing it pretty cool and much more eerie. I wasn't inside the mine shaft for very long when I began to hear something moving around. Now, at first, I thought it was my older brother. I had left him back at home because he didn't feel like joining me, but he was known to pull pranks like this. But when I saw what was moving around, it was too tall and much too thin to be my brother. I turned the flashlight towards it, and before the beam could touch it, whatever it was lunged at me, knocking me to the ground and forcing the breath out of me. As it scurried on all fours to try to get on top of me, I picked myself back up and ran crying out of the mine shaft. A few seconds after I broke out of the entrance, I turned back to the mine's opening to see if it was chasing me, but it wasn't there. But when I heard something jumping from branch to branch above me, I knew that it was no longer following me on the ground. It was giving chase through the trees. Somehow, I made it home covered in tears and sweat. My brother screamed at me, wanting to know what was wrong. I'd never seen him so worried, but I was too scared to answer. Both of us went silent, 
when something thudded at the window. Something had hit it extremely hard. We went over to the window and saw that it had been cracked and there was a trail of red leading off of it, off the side of the house and into the nearby forest. After this experience, I never ventured back out there and I quickly developed a fear of the forest and the dark. I haven't seen the creature again, but I've heard some very mysterious and scary noises coming from that same direction. I should have never gone into the mine shaft. Terrifying Monster from Pastel Demon Location Unknown Read by Stories, Fables, and Ghostly Tales I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August, and my cousins' ages ranged from 10 to 15, and I was the oldest, being 15. I was staying with a 10, 13, and 14-year-old. We stayed up, telling scary stories often, but one night a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far when you're driving down the road to a house, but in the backyard, it was a thick forest with man-made paths through it. Each house is on a hill, so only part of the basement was actually underground. That isn't important until later, though. So, we're towards the east side of her yard, in a smallish patch of open land. You couldn't see the neighbors' yards from there, and there were probably three quarters a mile to each side of us that belonged to my grandma. It was maybe 11 at night, and we were playing Truth or Dare after telling scary stories, and my 14-year-old cousin dared me and the 13-year-old to go walk through the paths for 10 minutes or so. I said yes right away, as I wasn't easily scared and rather level-headed, but my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. He didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark yet, and we could see enough to not die or injure ourselves. We were walking through the path for about five minutes, and could barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn. In the middle of the path was a large dog-like creature hunched over with its front hand an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so effing bright white, and it was humanoid dog-shaped, with a human-like head but a dog-like body with human hands and feet. It looked right at us and I know I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away the opposite way from us, towards a creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed bloody F and murder, and the other cousins and my grandma ran to us. I don't remember much here because I was really disorientated and I couldn't think properly, but I did wake up in bed, so I assumed that I was brought up to the house. All the kids slept in the basement, in a big room with sliding glass doors to the outside, as the room was on the side that wasn't underground. My bed was pressed against a big glass window, and I could see my cousins playing outside down below. The house is in Michigan, so it gets slightly chilly, even in the end of August. And there was a slight breeze, so I put on a jacket and ran to join them outside, skipping breakfast, not wanting to miss out on anything fun. When I got down, I could tell they weren't playing, but rather running to my grandma, they found her dogs, both of them, ripped up. That night we went to bed early. I woke up at maybe 2 in the morning because I felt something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting on the double bed opposite me on the other side of the room. There was one bunk bed and two double beds, with the double beds being for me and my 14-year-old cousin. They were being quiet and staring at me. The 13-year-old nodded his head towards the window. I froze. They all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to the side and I saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed so fucking loud that it bolted. My grandma called the police after I told her what happened and they found nothing. I went home after that and I have never been there during the night again. If you know what this place is, please. Tell me. From hairy monsters to skeletal pale humanoids, 
Skinwalkers, Wendigo, and Werewolves are quite a variety of boogeymen that could haunt you at any time. Step into the woods, stay home alone in the middle of nowhere, take a hike. You might just be the next lucky host to a salivating, hungry, supernatural creature. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the episode. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Care Of, via the link in the description using promo code DPP. A huge thanks goes out to them. If you want your story to possibly be featured in a future episode, submit it at darknessprevails.org. If you'd like to support this show yourself, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails, or you can shop our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails. Or if you're watching on YouTube, there should be a shop button below this video. Thank you. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous full episode. I'll be going back to the five real lycanthrope sightings video for the comments. Ace Love says, probably furries. Ugh, I don't know what's scarier. Ah, eh, just kidding. I think we're all a level of furry, thanks to Disney. David James Edwards says, Don't assume my crazy uncle wouldn't rip me apart. I'm pretty sure he could and would. Makes me excited to be an uncle now. And you know if darkness prevails as your uncle, he's gonna be extra, extra creepy. Link spelled with a one, one, says, This guy sounds like Terry. I don't know who Terry is, but I'm gonna hope that that's a compliment. Stormy Ross says, No joke. At 3 a.m. I had a prowler outside. I was only awake because I was listening to this video. Thank you for being a great security system. But that's nothing short of a miracle and a near scary story. I'm glad you're okay though, Stormy. And Lone Cookie says, I can relate to the guy in the second story who had this fixation with socks. I can't really say anything about that because I did take my wife's socks and wear them because they were fuzzy and warm last night. Love me some warm socks. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. But don't worry, guys. More scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my kind and loyal patrons. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one.